Now, Cape Town city centre tenants got the shocking news of their lives as municipality announced plans to auction their homes, saying that the Maynard Street homes are part of a deep proclaimed road scheme and are no longer required for municipal purposes. Now, if you have been following us, you know that we had this conversation uh, yesterday and uh, we couldn't get any resource person, but it has been uh, an ongoing conversation in Cape Town with people concerned for their homes. Now, some people have since questioned the city of Cape Town's decision to auction off its houses in well-located areas and in the midst of a housing crisis. Now, families who have been there for over three decades now, some more, some less, are distraught. The auction date has been set for November 23rd. Now, the funny thing is this information was not even communicated to these tenants prior to the delivery of their notice, which came on the 11th of October. Well, um, we're now joined on the show to discuss this by first Zama and Tulsa, um, our guests, uh, spokesperson, African Transformation Movement. And we also have Lidukule Patiwe, public affairs analyst, joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, hopefully, Zama will join us very shortly. Lidukule, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And good afternoon to your good afternoon. viewers as well. All right. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure. Now, what exactly um, does the city mean when they say that the, the homes that are set to be auctioned off are part of a deproclaimed road scheme that are no longer required for municipal purposes. Can you break that down for us? It's not really clear um, uh, what do they mean by deproclaimed road scheme. Um, but um, in the greater scheme, what the city is effectively saying is that for the city's, for the, for the city's foreseeable future programs, um, the city does not need those houses anymore. Um, you would know that the city has been using these houses as a way to get rental income into the city coffers. Um, and it has been an ongoing um, complaint from the city that um, people who stay in these houses are unable to pay. Um, which is not shocking because um, these are poor people. Um, and also at the same time, the city's own collective mechanisms uh, are very poor. Um, one of the tenants who've been um, staying in one of those houses saying whether they've not been receiving invoices since 2019. And up until that time, they've been paying their rates and services. Up until they were not getting any invoices. So it seems like the city is using this as an excuse um, to perpetuate its long-term plan um, of selling off prime land to the private sector um, using various number of Okay. And uh, do you think that that is enough reason to have these houses auctioned off? Not at all. Not at all. Um, I mean, I think as you said earlier on um, in your introductory commentary, um, we are in the middle of a housing crisis. Um, there's a huge backlog of people without housing, without, without access to housing. So it doesn't make sense at all for the city to be disposing of any land that it owns, especially land that is in prime um, areas that is easy for people, easy access to the job market, um, easy access to many other amenities that can enhance the well-being of the person. Um, but we've, over the years, we've seen that the city of Cape Town seems to have an allergy against poor people with living with within its vicinity. Um, this is the same city not so long ago, about two or three years ago, um, declared homelessness illegal. It was illegal to be homeless within the city of Cape Town, and people were fined just by not having a place to sleep in. So it seems like the city is using a number of mechanisms and excuses to get poor people out of the city and introduce the private sector um, and by doing that, increasing the rates and services that such, such that poor people are effectively taken to the outskirts of the city. I mean, some, of, some people have characterized this as a continuation of spatial apartheid uh, by the city of Cape Town. Right. 
Uh, now, isn't, isn't it ludicrous, though, that there was no prior notice? Now, some people complain, a lot of them actually complain that uh, these houses are set to be auctioned off on the 23rd of November, and they're just getting notices on the 11th. What do you make of that? Again, it's part of this, this very villainous um, attitude from the people, because they know that um, if they were to give prior notice, um, of these evictions, um, the tenants would have had other mechanisms to block this. They would have uh, an opportunity to go to the courts. Um, they, there are a number of uh, platforms in which they could have contested um, that situation. For example, if the argument is that they've not been paying their rates um, for a particular number um, of months or years, they could have been able to contest, to contest that. They could have been able to even get into um, a paying mechanism with the city. Um, this was deliberate so, such that the people who are affected by this move do not have any recourse um, on in, in challenging it. The processes are already on the way, that they have no other choice but to leave. So it's not shocking. Um, from the city that they didn't give enough prior notice, precisely because it was a deliberate plan not to do it. It's mm -hmm. not some mistake um, or some oversight. It was part of the deliberate plan um, to kick them out and make sure that there's no way of contesting that. Right. Uh, now, looking at this development, is the city at least planning to provide any alternative housing options for these tenants that will be displaced? It's not clear that they are willing to do that. Um, a comment that was made by the MMC um, for human settlement, um, when asked about that, they said that the city will look into um, uh, finding alternative accommod uh, accommodation if necessary. Um, so now you can already tell that He's giving off an, a, a space in which the city has the right not to go, to give this alternative accommodation. And also, historically, um, the city has never been able to give adequate alternative accommodation to people. Um, it has used places like Blackie's Store, which is about 30 to 40 kilometers outside of the city center. Um, and also, it's fabricated... Um, Shanty towns um, that are said to be temporary, uh, but have been there for more than 20, for more than 10 years. Um, so even if the city does end up giving alternative accommodation, chances are it's going to be anything between 30 to 45 kilometers outside of the city centre. And now you can just imagine um, the consequences of that to the to the actually affected families. Someone who are staying. Um, close to the city, paying less than 10 rand a day to travel into to work um, and back, now will have to exponentially increase that budget of their salary by three or four fold, um, especially now that trains also have not yet been back in full operation into the outskirts of the city. So people are uh, are forced to take minibus taxis, which are very expensive to travel in. So you will find a situation where the, the ratio of the budget, um, of the transport budget to the actual salary might increase for a number of these families from 10% of their income to something as almost as 40 to 50%. That is a serious um, human rights problem. Because well, now it means that these families, effectively, what it say, what effectively will mean is that his family will be made poorer by the city. Because now they won't be able to pay other things that they were able to pay for. They will have to decrease some of the things that they've been paying for food um, and all of that because they have to prioritize being able to get to work. So it's right. a very um, complex situation that the city is putting um, these families in. And uh, also, are there any efforts that have been made by maybe local advocacy groups or non-governmental organizations to try and support these people? 
Um, well, there, there has been some um, work over the years that has been done by organizations like Nukwazi um, and Reclaim the City um, that has been um, advocating um, for uh, uh, poor people's rights within the city center. And there's also um, the Black Youth National Crisis Committee that at one stage also um, did something uh, on behalf of the homeless within the city. So there is uh, some work that has been done by advocacy groups. But what is problematic about this, uh, this recent move, as I was saying earlier on, is that the city did not give enough notice deliberately because it knew that the tenants could go to this advocacy group and ask for help. And then these advocacy groups could have done, could have had a number of options at their disposal. Now, that the, the options at the disposal of anyone who wants to help has been severely limited. Um, the option is happening just in a few weeks' time. Um, if you want to block this, you have to go to the court. The courts have to decide whether it's an agent basis or not an agent basis. And while you're going to court, it doesn't mean that the city's processes will stop. Um, by the time that you you win the court case, you'll find that the houses have already been demolished. And um, this is something that, for example, we are seeing um, around the city also in the in the observatory area with the Amazon building. Even if you look at the development there, the building, as much as it was, it has been raised that it is trampling on indigenous land um, and also the environmental problems um, around the building structure. The structure is almost complete. So even if people now win the court case around whether the structure is supposed to be built or not, it becomes an academic question because the structure is already there. It becomes an academic question whether you win in the court um, about your eviction from um, the main street. The building is already destroyed. So you don't have any home to go back to in any case. So the, this was a really deliberate plan from the city such that there's no one who's able to make any kind of moves in helping the families that are being affected. But there are some um, civil society organizations that I know um, are not sleeping, trying to look at options on how to help um, with the evictions. All right. Uh, it's been a very insightful conversation, uh, Linda Cooley. Thank you so much for letting us in on what's happening in Cape Town. And hopefully this issue can be resolved and there is alternative or at least makeshift places made available for these displaced, these people that are about to be displaced, people who have spent about three decades of their lives in these homes, having sentimental attachment as well as mental and physical attachment to their homes as well. Once again, thank you, Linda Kule Patiwe, Public Affairs Analyst from Cape Town, South Africa. Thanks a lot for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, this is where we call it a wrap on Village Square Africa. It's been an insightful conversation from Nigeria down to South Africa, finding out these issues. And do also follow us on other um, subsequent episodes as we discuss trending topics across the continent and probably uh, prefer solutions to these challenges that Africa faces as a whole. I'm Blessings Bosugu. It's been very insightful having you join me. Thank you so much for joining us on VSA. Do stay with us as the news comes up next.